Hello, good evening, and welcome to the final talks of Antarctica Now. I'm Ian Holcroft, co-founder of Shackleton. Normally at this time of year, thousands of people will be visiting Antarctica. Scientists, researchers, filmmakers, explorers, and of course, tourists. But unfortunately, Antarctica is essentially closed. So we're bringing Antarctica to you. If you're joining us for the first time this evening, welcome. It's great to have you. You can catch up on all the week's talks on our website, shackletonlondon.com. We've enjoyed incredible speakers covering a broad range of topics from geopolitics, science, technology, photography, architecture, engineering, wildlife, and of course, climate change. If you've been with us throughout the week, thank you for your support. It's been a brilliantly attended event and we've received incredible feedback from the entire audience around the world. This evening, we turn our attention to exploration and it is my great pleasure to introduce two titans of Antarctic expeditions. At 6 p.m., we'll be talking to record-breaking polar explorer and Shackleton director of expeditions, Louis Rudd. I'll be hosting Louis on a separate Zoom link. So if we're running slightly behind schedule with Steve, please don't jump off. I'll give you the details at the end of this talk. So first up this evening, I'm honored to introduce Steve Jones. Steve is the expeditions manager of an organization called Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions. ALE offer air transport, logistical support and guided expeditions for those venturing into Antarctica. Steve could be described as the gatekeeper, but he is much more than just that. As well as the first port of call for those wishing to explore, he also monitors their progress and is their support throughout the expedition. Through our involvement in two record-breaking Antarctic expeditions, Scott Sears in 2017 and Louis Rudd in 2018-2019, Steve, we've got to know Steve well and has become a good friend of Shackleton. He's in a unique position to provide us with fascinating insights across multiple expeditions and how to respond to explorers' needs. Steve will be walking, maybe I should say Paul calling, us through 100 years of Antarctic exploration. What modern explor explorers can still learn from the heroic age and what are the future challenges? There will be an opportunity to ask questions, so please feel free to post any questions on the, um, on the question and answer board and we'll endeavor to get through as many as possible. It's a great pleasure to introduce Steve Jones. Steve, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. It's great to be here. Hello, I've been going on polar expeditions to the Arctic, to the Antarctic and to elsewhere for, for half my life. And for about 20 years, I've been helping other people plan their expeditions. And I'm hoping in the next few minutes to take you on a journey through some familiar historic expeditions but hopefully tell you something about them or give you a different perspective that you've not heard before and share with you some stunning images some of which have never been published before about polar expeditions over the last few years in the 80 years after Roald Amundsen and Robert Falcon Scott first reached the South Pole in the 1911-1912 summer season. In the following 80 years, only 25 people reached the South Pole on foot. But in the last 30 years, 369 more people trekked across Antarctica to 90 degrees south from various different starting points, some from Water's Edge, some from inland edge of the ice shelves, more about ice shelves in a minute. And this season was the first season for 30 years that no one reached the South Pole on, on foot. Perhaps one of the more esoteric consequences of COVID-19. I'm going to talk, concentrate on the Traverse expeditions that tried to get all the way across Antarctica because they tended to be the ones pushing the limits of, of what was possible at the time. And for those of you who've come for the penguins, these are the last ones. We're looking down onto the surface of part of the Axel Heiberg Glacier, the famous glacier pioneered by Roald Amundsen on his route to the South Pole. And if you look very carefully between all the crevasses, and most of what you can see are, are crevasses, you might just see a faint line. And if you're on a small screen, then it follows this red line. Everything else you can see are crevasses. It's January 2009 
and we're looking out of the pickup aircraft that is flying down the glacier to pick up two exceptionally remarkable people who have just joined a very short list of people who have ever skied up or down this one of the remotest glaciers in the world. Now, Norwegian Cecily Skog and her American companion Ryan Waters have skied their last steps off the bottom of the glacier onto the Ross ice shelf and their ski tracks go back an incredible 1,800 kilometres or more than 1,100 miles from the base of the Axel Heiberg Glacier via the South Pole all the way back to their starting point on Berkner Island in, on the, in the Ronnie Filchner ice shelf. More than a decade later, nobody has been able to ski further than they did in Antarctica without resupply or without using, using wind power or wind, wind assistance. And trying to ski further than they did without resupply, setting off with everything you need at the beginning of an expedition and without using kiting, is one of the next big challenges in Antarctica. A very quick recap on, uh, on polar geography. And I'm not going to try and confuse you by talking about east and, east and west. So we'll just say at the top of the picture is the Weddell Sea and the second biggest ice shelf, the Ronnie Filchner ice shelf with Birkner Island in the middle. And at the bottom of the picture is the Ross ice shelf flowing out into the, the Ross Sea facing Australia and, and New Zealand. And the two red lines marking the water's edge between the, the sea and, 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 and the ice shelf Obviously, it's not it's not open water in much of the year because over the winter the the sea ice ex, the sea freezes and sea ice extends out for miles and miles and miles. But if you were trying to get to Antarctica by ship, as the first expeditions had to, they could only go as far as hitting hitting the edge of the ice shelf or land, and they had to set off from there. So the edge, the water's edge, if you like, has great validity today as being a start or a finish line for a major expedition trying to get all the way across Antarctica. But with the advent of aircraft and air support, that opened up lots of options for starting and finishing in different places, as, as we'll see. But Cecily Skog and Ryan Waters, who we just, just mentioned, they didn't need to cross all the way across the Ross ice shelf to reach a pickup ship because we're going to pick them up by, by aircraft. And we're picking them up there for two reasons. They've effectively run out of run out of the summer season. They've been skiing for about 70 days and it's very difficult. There's only usually about 80 to 85 days between the first flight in and the, and the last flight out at the end, end of the brief summer season. So they, they were pretty much out of time. And also that's where they had decided to stop because they didn't think they would be able to go much further setting off with everything they needed at the beginning of the expedition and an and unsupported journey. The shipborne expeditions of the heroic age at the beginning of the 20th century had to reach Antarctica at the very end of summer when the sea ice around the continent was at its minimum and they had, a, had the best possible chance of, of reaching the continent itself. This meant they couldn't go to and they couldn't set off on their ski expedition to the South Pole the same year that they travelled to Antarctica. They had to get their wooden ships through the sea ice around, around the continent, find somewhere safe to, to, to moor their vessel, offload, build a hut, endure the bitter cold and months of complete darkness of the Antarctic winter, and then be ready the following spring to set off on their expeditions to the South Pole. As we say a lot at work, what could possibly go wrong? This remained the logistics framework for anyone trying to go on an expedition to the South Pole right up until the 1980s. Going back to nearer the start, we all know that Captain Scott reached the South Pole in January 1912, about a month after Roald Amundsen's Norwegian expedition had, had, had beaten him to it. And here is Captain Scott and his companions looking at the tent that Almondson had left at the pole as proof that he had, he had been there. And to give some context to what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes, we're going to spend a short time looking at the planning and decision-making that Captain Scott made during the outfitting of his, 
expedition. An expedition preparing to go to Antarctica this year or, or next year can actually learn a surprising amount by giving careful analysis to the preparation and the decisions that Captain Scott and his team made as they prepared for their expedition. And Antarctica is the continent that has changed the least over the last hundred years. It is just as unforgiving today as it was in Amundsen and Scott's day. And if you make a mistake on expedition in Antarctica today, you very usually know about it before bedtime and quite often before the first hour, hour is up. And I, before we go on, I'd just like to point out one thing about the clothing in this photograph. Because when you're towing a sledge, even if it's minus 30, it's such hard work that you're generating enough heat but you don't actually need to be wearing very many clothes you, un, under your, your outer windproof clothing. You absolutely need windproof clothing. And Captain Scott and his team have got effective, good windproof clothing. They've got big mitts. It looks like they've got good, good hand protection. But they've stopped now. And if this was a modern photograph, they would all be wearing down jackets or, or, or down parkas. Nowadays, when we stop, as soon as we stop, you pull on a big, a big over jacket and that stops you from getting cold because you're only wearing enough clothing underneath to keep warm whilst you're moving. And it took me a long time looking at looking at these old photographs of Captain Scott's expeditions to, to, to really to notice this point at all and to think that they must have frozen and been chilled to the core every time they stopped because they didn't have more, more insulating clothing to put on. Now the distance Captain Scott and his team had to travel to get to the South Pole at all was the equivalent of starting from the Shackleton shop in London and skiing all the way to Vienna, the South Pole, turning round and skiing and walking all the way back again. And Captain Scott needed to move a pyramid of supplies southwards through a series of resupply depots to, to feed himself and his team on their outward polar journey and the return leg back from the pole and back towards their, their hut and to safety. And I, I've looked really hard, but haven't been able to find a graphic representation of, of, of this logistics planning. But this is the next best thing. This, uh, I'm, I'm, this is the, um, the sledging plan drawn up by Aeneas McIntosh, who was the leader of Ernest Shackleton's Ross Sea Party on his Transantarctic expedition. Here are the outward journeys, 10 days out, 10 days back from their base camp on, on Ross Island. And they're going, doing multiple trips out and back to, to resupply or supply the first depot. And when that has got enough supplies and provisions in it, they move south, further down the page, away from their most northerly base camp. And, and by this method are slowly getting a, a, a sequence of depots established. If you looked at a logistics plan for a mountain, then it's the other way round. And this is the chart showing who was where when on the first ascent of Everest in 1953. These are the key geographical features of the mountain. And these are the sequentially numbered camps, which equate to the depots that Scott and, and co had to, had to lay across the Ross Ice Shelf towards the pole. A key detail, a vital detail that this shows not only is who, who was where when, but how long it took every individual to get back from, a t from their current task and when they were ready to start the next one. And I mention this because this is something that went really badly wrong for Captain Scott. And a final and very different example of expeditionary logistics. This is from the Falklands conflict in, in 1982. And this is part of the refueling, the air-to-air -air refueling plan drawn up by the Royal Air Force to get one RAF bomber from Ascension Islands to bomb the runway at Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands. 17 aircraft took off and 17 aircraft were needed to deliver one aircraft that distance and get everybody back safely. It's a, it's a really complicated plan made as simple as it can be but the key thing for us is that at every stage there is spare capacity and reserves built into the plan. So if something goes wrong with one aircraft, they've got reserves and they can refuel each other and get everybody back to base safely. And expedition planning is effectively 
project management, an exercise in project management, in which one error, one mistake, can cause the expedition to fail. And Captain Scott knew this, of course, because he'd been to Antarctica before. He'd led the discovery expedition at the, at the beginning of the century. And for me, knowing everything that he did know, it makes it really hard to understand some of the decisions he made and what, to my mind, are both strategic and tactical errors. Captain Scott had six years to learn the lessons from his and apply the lessons from his discovery expedition. Ernest Shackleton had been back from his Nimrod expedition for more than a year before they set off on the Terra Nova expedition. But as we know, Captain Scott decided to use people, uh, skiers and Siberian ponies and husky sled dogs and Wolseley tracked vehicles to move his supplies south through, his, through the series of depots that he needed to, needed to establish. It seems obvious, but that's four different methods of transport, which are going to travel at four different speeds, but require four different types of expertise. But he needs to train his staff and his personnel in four different skill sets. They require four different types of food or fuel, and they've got four different load capacities. So planning this was an absolute nightmare. And it was going to be really easy to end up with horse fodder in a depot when they needed petrol for the, for the caterpillar tracks or dog food when they needed food for the men. And they were dedicating tons of payload on an already overloaded and overcrowded ship on ideas which were basically unproven and that they hadn't trained and tested effectively for. Scott's plan was to take every available option throw them at the situation and do his best to work it out as he went along. In which case, he could have taken a few Bactrian camels, a few reindeer and why not a few yaks for good, for good measure. But the more moving parts there are, the more there is to go wrong. And Scott only had one expert on skiing, one expert on, on, on the ponies, one expert on the dogs, who ironically was the person who bought the ponies, and one expert in his motor sledges who'd, who'd worked for a different company and not, the, not Wolseley who sent, uh, who sent his vehicles. And this overcomplication and dilution of expertise were two strategic errors which were going to come back and, and bite him. A principle of expedition planning today is to look for single points of failure and to work really hard to remove them. For example, today a satellite phone is an essential item of equipment. And to avoid the single point of failure, you take two. But then you look at all, all the cables, the charging leads, the ancillaries you need, and make sure, make sure you've got a spare for each of those. So there's no single point of failure in your communication system at all. You take two stoves. You take two GPSs, two compasses. Everything that is mission critical has a spare. But equally, weight is really important and you can't afford to carry lots and lots of spares that you don't need. And this is one of the dilemmas of expedition planning today. You can buy really strong, robust stuff that won't break, but it's not the lightest option available. And this trade-off between light and durability and having spare capacity to cope when things go wrong are difficult decisions. And the longer the expedition you're planning, the harder these decisions are. In 1908, Scott went to the French Alps to trial two prototype French Caterpillar tracked vehicles for his, his expedition. He chose the, uh, the heavy one and in fact it sank into the snow and, and, and didn't work. So he then moved on to working with Wolseley Motor Company in Birmingham and they developed some Caterpillar tracked vehicles for him. And they worked really well in Birmingham. And to his credit, they did the right thing. They bore the cost of transporting them to Norway, where they could be tested in snow, in low temperatures, in winter. They didn't work. The steel that they were made from was very brittle in the cold, and an axle broke after only 50 metres of, of travel. It's a truism that what doesn't work at home definitely won't work in Antarctica. And Captain Scott didn't make the difficult decisions to leave some of this his equipment behind when he had seen for himself that it didn't work in the cold. And over the years, we've seen all sorts of novel vehicles and sensible vehicles that work at home, but don't work in the deep snow or the conditions in Antarctica. 
Captain Scott got an awful lot right, just outfitting that expedition and getting it to, to Antarctica with several years of supplies was, was a major achievement. My point is, you only need to get a little bit wrong for the whole expedition to, to fail. And he did make several mistakes in planning, in outfitting, and then in expedition management during the expedition. And those, as we know, had, had fatal consequences. A, one, Scott sent two men on a printing course so that they would be able to produce the South Polar Times during the Antarctic winter. But most of the men didn't have any training in skiing, which was an absolutely fundamental skill, until they actually got to Antarctica. And effective training is absolutely vital. Nowadays, I expect expeditions planning a South Pole expedition to spend two or three years gaining experience and training in somewhere like Norway or Minnesota, cold places and going on and building experience in, in Svalbard or here, which is me on the right, in, in Greenland. And what Captain Scott should have done was taken all of his options, the ponies, the dogs and everything, to, some, to the same place in winter and trained thoroughly with them until they either had proficiency or had proved that they didn't work or weren't quite good enough, in which case he could have made some decisions. And I think if they had done that, they'd have left behind the motor sledges and they'd have left behind the Siberian ponies and they'd have had a simpler, more robust, and more reliable logistical plan. I really like this picture. This is some of the team preparing rations in, in Scott's hut at Cape Evans. And just to point out, the youthful looking man on, on the right is absolutely Cherry Garrard, the author of the, the best book ever written about anything polar, The Worst Journey in the World, which if you haven't read it, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. But the purpose of putting this up is that they're preparing and packing rations. And the rations that the, 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 the Scott's expedition had were in my view, the single largest contributing factor to, to the death of Scott and his polar party. They were eating about 4,400 calories a day and burning at least 6,000. And that daily calorific deficit adds up over the days and weeks that they were out until they're physically really debilitated. And selecting and pl plan and preparing rations is, is a Im really important part of any expedition today. And it's still a really big challenge to get the right food as light as, light as possible, particularly for a long, say, two month or more unsupported polar journey. This is Amundsen at the pole. As soon as the news got out that Roald Amundsen and his Norwegian expedition had reached the pole safely and got back safely in, in, in December 1911, the race was on and people started planning the next big challenge, which was perceived to be to, uh, the crossing of the Antarctic continent from one side to the other. The first two expeditions to try this were led by Wilhelm Filchner from Germany and Sir Ernest Shackleton from, from Britain. And exactly, <laughs> strangely enough, stra exactly the same thing happened to both of them. They both got their ships stuck in the sea ice in the Weddell Sea for a, for a full winter, neither really and neither got started on the land journey to try and cross the continent. Uh, and just to point out here, Armand's team, Armand's team were wearing furs and their, their clothing and insulation was significantly different to Captain Scott's team. They didn't have a problem of being cold when they stopped. This is a dinner party sketch drawn by Ernest Shackleton to try to explain to somebody at a dinner party his plan for crossing the continent. And I, I should just point out, it's not upside down. The wording, the writing is all upside down. But if you look at the geography with South America at the top and New Zealand at the bottom, it's all, the, the, the map is orientated the right, the right way for, the, for this purpose. So in, in essence, the plan is very simple. You sail from South America into the Weddell Sea, find, find somewhere to get ashore, build a base over winter, and then set off the, in the spring pioneering a new route through terrain which nobody's ever seen before towards the pole, over the pole onto the route that's familiar, picking up resupplies that have been laid by another party, the Ross Sea Party, and hopefully reaching safety on, on the Ross Sea side and then sailing home via New Zealand. Now, in, it's really interesting because we all know what happened 
the, the ship, the Endurance, got stuck in the ice. They never got started. It was one of the world's great survival stories, getting his men home, home, home alive and safely. But I think, in many ways, Shackleton was lucky because if he had been able to set off, knowing what we know now about the terrain that was between him and the pole, I think he would either have turned back and given up fairly shortly and said this is too hard, but I don't think that was really within his character. Or, I think more likely, he and his team would have perished and disappeared without trace in the interior of the Antarctic. In which case, perhaps by now, they would just be a footnote in polar history. After Shackleton's expedition, which was 1914 to, to 16, 40 years went by before anyone tried to cross Antarctica again. And of course, this, there was the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War. So you might have thought there wasn't any time or interest for going on this sort of thing. But at the same time, in the Himalayas, this was the golden age of Himalayan mountaineering when the 8,000 metre peaks were climbed for the first time. And on Everest, a New Zealand beekeeper became one of the most famous people in the world. And we're going to hear more about him in a minute. It's time to meet the Fukas. It's 1957, which was established by international agreement as the International Geophysical Year. And IGY was a really significant year but for, for space and space exploration and space science on both sides of the, of the Iron Curtain and especially in Antarctica where it launched a whole series of new research programs and new bases built and, and established for the first time. And in Britain, Vivian Fuchs planned and then led the Commonwealth Transantarctic Expedition. His plan was in out, outline to follow Shackleton's plan and Wilhelm Filchner's plan. Sail into, but it, he's now got a metal ship with an engine, into the Weddell Sea, build a base over winter, and then set off with every technical advantage that he can get towards the South Pole the following year. So he's got a spotter plane, he's got dog teams, he's got various different types of vehicle. And here he is, this is Vivian Fuchs, the expedition leader. I put this in because this map kind of amuses me. It's a newspaper graphic trying to explain explain the, their, the achievement of this expedition, but I think almost absolutely everything is wrong about it. They didn't start from quite from from where it shows, and they they did go via the South Pole, and that isn't their route across the Ross Ice Shelf. But it, but it, what it does show is the simplicity in, in essence of an Antarctic traverse from the Weddell Sea at the top of the picture to the Ross Sea at the, at the bottom, obviously going via the South Pole. And this is something we're going to come back to time and again as the story unfolds. This is a really famous picture, um, oh, but it isn't actually of a crevasse. It's of a chasm on the Filchner ice shelf. And they these these chasms are still there today. And you can but nowadays you can see them on, on satellite photographs and they remain a significant hazard for anyone traveling there today. Meanwhile, on the, on the New Zealand side of the continent, Sir Edmund Hillary, back from Everest, was in charge of the New Zealand party and they have established a, a new base called Scott Base on Ross Island and from there they've pioneered a new route suitable for vehicles up onto the Antarctic Plateau and they're driving towards the South Pole with enough supplies to leave depots for both their return journey and for Fuchs's second leg as he comes across and meets them. And unlike Shackleton and all, and, all, and all their predecessors, they had communications. So all of the moving parts of this extremely complex project could be coordinated and, and adapted as, as, the, as the situation evolved. This was a monumental effort by Britain and New Zealand, which succeeded in making the first crossing of Antarctica. Their journey was 2,158 miles, and it was an, an epic of human determination and ingenuity, mechanical problem solving, and, and drama after drama. Few expeditions will be able to replicate the budget and resources of this expedition. But several came close. And in the 1980s, three expeditions marked the end of the, e end of the era when expeditions could only get to Antarctica in their own ships and over winter. And three expeditions, which we're going to look at very briefly, had one foot in the past because they arrived in their own ships 
and one foot in the future because they had up-to-date and efficient air support. The first of these was the Transglobe expedition, led by Rand Fiennes. They drove across the continent using skidoos. This was um, a massive expedition. They were to go all the way around the world via both poles by surface travel. It was seven years of planning and three years of expedition. And in my view, this was the best expedition of Rand Fiennes' career by a, by a country mile. The second of the three expeditions was the Footsteps of Scott expedition, another three-man team. They were the first people since Captain Scott in January 1912 to reach the South Pole on foot. They had no GPS. Roger Meir navigated using a sextant. They had no satellite phone, no comms with the outside world, no air support until they reached the pole, no Twitter feed, no Instagram, complete isolation and a level of commitment and risk that simply doesn't exist today. For Rob Swan, this expedition was the start of a, a lifelong commitment to campaigning for environmental protection and for Antarctica. And today, some expeditions place huge importance on the meaning of the word unsupported, which basically means setting off with everything you need at the beginning and not having any resupplies or help along the way. But expeditions now have satellite phones, two-way tracking beacons. There was Antarctic logistics and expeditions there with a base providing safety cover with with ski equipped aircraft on standby and in reality the level of support that even the remotest expeditions have today was absolutely unimaginable to these of only 35 years ago. The third expedition was led by Norwegian Monica Christiansen and she took the risk of not overwintering and trying to get to the pole using two dog sled teams in one summer season. But very sadly for her, they were delayed um, by the ice and they got to got to the starting point at the Bay of Wales where Amundsen had started about three weeks behind schedule. And they came under huge political pressure to turn back and not to run the risk of, of calling on, on government resources to, to help them. And sadly, I think they did, turn, they, they, they did turn back and she didn't quite make it to poll. But Monica Christensen has done a huge amount of in, in Antarctica, both before and after this expedition, and she deserves to be much better known. By 1989, expeditions didn't need their own ship anymore. They could fly in and out of Antarctica in, in one summer season using a company called Adventure Network International, or ANI, which became ALE or was, was taken over by ALE in, in 2003. And the high point of the era of dog sled expeditions was this 1989 International Trans-Antarctic Expedition. It's a never-to-be-repeated expedition. They spent 220 days dog sledding, as you can see on this red line, from near the top of the Antarctic Peninsula, round the Ellsworth Mountains, to the South Pole, and out across East Antarctica, which is very, very rarely travelled by, by non-government expeditions, uh, by Vostok out to Murny, a Russian base on the on the on the on the right hand side of the picture it they traveled 6020 kilometers or more than 3700 miles and uh, since then dogs have been banned from the continent and and it'll never be repeated and in the same season the famous mountaineer reinhold messner and a german companion arved fuchs in no relation to vivian who met earlier were also down trying to do a two-man crossing on the now familiar to us route from Weddell Sea via Pole to, to Roth Sea. In fact, there was a was a shortage of, of Asia, aviation fuel and there wasn't enough fuel to get them to Birkner Island where they wanted to start. So they compromised and started from the inland edge of the, the Filchner ice shelf. They also had a resupply and they used the best available kiting technology to give to, to try and, if you like, horizontal parachuting to give them wind power to tow them along when the wind was going in the right direction. And they obviously had 80s hair. They were the first expedition to use GPS. They no longer needed to learn how to navigate with a sextant. And Reinhold Mester's achievements in the mountaineering are, were absolutely exceptional. As many of you will know, he was the first person to climb all 14 8,000 metre peaks in the Himalayas, the first person to climb Everest without oxygen, the first to solo Mount Everest. 
And in addition to being famously fit and determined with physical fitness training, he applied himself with a level of professional planning and detail to get everything right when he transferred his knowledge from mountaineering to polar travel. But he, you know, he, he did an exceptionally good job. And for example, he realised that if you're going to cross-country ski towing a sled, you need to have softish cross-country warm b b soft boots. And if you want to kite and you be towed along using the wind, you need to have rigid plastic ski boots that can, can be clamped down onto your skis. And the, the trade-off there was you need to take two pairs of skis and two pairs of boots, which they did. Three years later, the two-man British team that sounds like a four-man team of Twistleton, Wickham, Fines on the left and Stroud on the right set off on basically the same route as everybody else from Berkner Island via the pole to try and get to Ross Island, 2,800 or so kilometres away. Their plan was to ski unsupported, setting off with monstrously heavy sleds with everything in that they needed for the whole expedition. They weren't allowed a resupply, but they also allowed themselves to use the best wind power technology called upskis that were available at the time. And for reasons I've never, I've never understood, they didn't learn from the success of Messner's expedition or the success of the International Transantarctic Dog Sled Expedition. And they made some really quirky equipment decisions which 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 didn't work for them for example they they took one pair of rigid or well semi rigid plastic ski mountaineering boots and tried to go the whole way in those and for any of you who've ever tried to walk half a kilometer across a ski resort in plastic ski boots you'll know how uncomfortable that is and unsurprisingly they 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 shredded their feet and their their sense of fun they also made some weird navigation route finding decisions along along the Filchner ice shelf, which didn't work out very well. And they, they basically went through the shear zone along the edge of the, of the island to avoid the height gain to get onto safe safe flat terrain on, 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 on the top of the island. They ran out of puff after an incredible 94 days on the Ross ice shelf. They came down the Beardmore Glacier, pioneered by Shackleton and, and Scott, but they didn't have and any fuel left in the tank to get, get across the Ross ice shelf. And if you read Mike Stroud's really excellent book, Shadows on the Wasteland, you'll be shocked to read how close they were to dying at the time when they were picked up at the end. They were really hospital cases at the end. And this is an important point for expeditions today. Courage, perseverance, determination are just as important now as they were then, but they've got to be matched by technical ability and, and, and technical knowledge and proficiency. This is also a really significant expedition in our story because by the time terms of their own aim of doing water's edge to water's edge crossing, they hadn't succeeded. But obviously, if you're a professional explorer, you need to get some success out of every expedition and every every story. And and so Ranfines changed, moved the goalposts a little bit and said, well, we succeeded in crossing the continental landmass, you know, if you're just ignoring the Ross Ice Shelf. But the Ross Ice Shelf is, 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 is hard to ignore. It's the largest body of floating water in the world. It's 500,000 square kilometres. It's the size of Spain or for British traditionalists when it comes to size comparisons, it's 24 times the size of Wales. But thanks to the the availability of, of aircraft and modern modern support not making it to a finishing line was no longer a death sentence and the polar community assessed that it was probably possible to do better on route planning probably better possible to do better on equipment and suffer a bit less and a race was on to become the first person to to try and ski solo across antarctica from coast to coast and the rules that people came up with were that it was okay to to use whatever wind power technology you could to have some wind assistance, but you couldn't have any resupplies. It was going to be an unsupported crossing using using wind assistance. And in 1995, a real race was on between three people: Borger Ausland from Norway, Marek Kaminski from Poland, and Roger Mir from the UK, all starting. None made it across. But Burger made it to the South Pole and learnt a lot and was ready to come back and try again the next year. The following year, Marek Kaminski was back. 
Roger Mir had been replaced by Ranulf Fiennes, who was down to have down to have another go, and Borger Ausland was back again. All set off on the solo crossing. And Borger was the only one who made it across. He succeeded. And it really is an exceptional landmark achievement in the annals of, 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 of polar history. In 65 days, he had skied and with some wind assistance, travelled 2,845 kilometres all the way across the continent without having any resupplies on, on, on the way. And one of the challenges for people who've come after him is he did such an incredible thing with this expedition, but it's been really hard for his, his successors to write their own names into the, the polar, polar history books. And in fact, one of the things which, which you know, proves what, a, what an astonishing achievement it was is that over the coming years, several people and several teams tried to replicate this, this expedition and none of them made it. So looking back over the time, it really is a remarkable achievement. This is a quick reminder of his route, so very similar to that planned by, by Shackleton and, and, and actually travelled by, by, by Fuchs. And over the next few years, polar expedition community really divided into, into, two, into two camps. Those who used the really rapidly developing uh, wind power technology where kites have got better and better and better, and the human powered sled hauling journeys. And they're really now very different things. The technology has improved a lot since Borger's day, and they're now as different as rowing and sailing. And you could think of them as two different polar sports played on the same pitch. Now, there have been a lot of men and not many women in our story so far, but women have been, been travelling to Antarctica and skiing to the South Pole since the, the start of the air-supported era in the 1980s. Liev Arneson was, a, was only the second person to ski solo to the South Pole and the first woman to do so. And then she came back with Anne Bancroft in 2000 and very nearly succeeded at a, at a, at a monumental crossing starting from Queen Maudland. In 2003 there was another race when two British women found themselves to be both planning to try planning to try to become the first British woman to ski solo to the South Pole. Fiona Thornwell and Rosie Stancer down on the left there, they both succeeded. They both did really well and they knocked days off the, the, the then existing sort of speed record time or fastest time to the South Pole from Hercules Inlet. And this record was broken again by Hannah McKeon a couple of years later. In 2011, Felicity Aston became the first woman to do a solo crossing of, of the continental landmass. And she started from the base of the Leverett Glacier skied up there to the South Pole and then all the way down to Hercules Inlet on the, on the, on the Ronnie Ice Shelf. In 2015, Henry Worsley became the first person to try effectively Felicity's expedition, but without, any, without, a, without a resupply, trying to become the first person to get all the way across the continental landmass without resupply and without using, using wind power. And as most of you will, will know, Tragically, he died in hospital of peritonitis at the end of his expedition. He'd, he'd skied for 71 days and no one has ever skied further than him um, solo and, and, and unsup unsupported. His distance record still stands to this day. And the photograph of, of, of Henry is actually at the end of an earlier expedition and the compass he's holding is Ernest Shackleton's real compass. Ben Saunders was the next to try and he, he stopped at the South Pole. He realised he hadn't got enough time to carry on to complete the traverse, but adding to his already impressive achievements in both Antarctica and, and the Arctic. Now, let's pause for a second and look at the current state of play for, exp for logistics um, and the facilities and options for expeditions wanting to come to Antarctica today. There are air access routes from all of the nearest continents around, around Antarctica. But much of the flying to Antarctica is done by government programmes. And you're, if you're not a government, not working for one of the national Antarctic programmes, you've only got two options. You can fly from Cape Town in South Africa into Novo Lazarevskaya in, in Queen Maud Land, or you can fly from Punta Arenas into Union Glacier with, 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 with ALE. And as I was said in the introduction, I work as the expeditions manager for Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions. And 
ALE can get you an expedition to pretty much anywhere in West Antarctica, but we can't go to East Antarctica. It's, it's just too far for the range of our ski equipped aircraft. We can get people to the Bay of Wales on the Ross Ice Shelf, but we can't get people to McMurdo. It's a, just a bit too far. This is ALE's Union Glacier Camp showing the uh, socially distanced staff accommodation. And the, the scale of the operation is, is really impressive and the, 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 the pool of knowledge within the staff team is, is, is unequalled. All Antarctic expedition plans are restricted by four factors. The team's abilities, the money they've got available, the time available between the first flight in and the last flight out, and the range, as I mentioned, of the, of the support aircraft. And what's interesting is only the first two of these are within, within the uh, control of an expedition. Thanks to Eric Phillips of Icetrek for this map showing new expedition routes. And you can see here a cluster of starting and finishing points in West Antarctica, supported by ALE, and a cluster up here in Queen Maudland accessed from Cape Town. All of these Queen Maudland routes are kiting expeditions where people have used wind power to travel the 2,000 kilometres or so from there to the pole. No one has yet skied from there to the pole without using wind power. Oh, there's an idea. Most ski expeditions come and challenge themselves on three established routes, Hercules Inlet, the Messner Start and Birkner Island, which you've heard, heard quite a bit about. And in theory, if you're looking for something new to do, you look at the map, there's lots of, lots of Antarctica with no lines going to the pole. So in theory, there's lots of areas where, where you could ski a new route. But in reality, either it's going to be super expensive to get to or you were so far away from a pole that you, you probably wouldn't be able to do it in one in one summer season. And this brings us up to two years ago when half a dozen people were planning and hoping to become the first person to ski across the continental landmass without 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 resupply and without using using wind power. It's nine hundred miles or one thousand four hundred and forty four kilometres of a significant tough polar journey. It's uh, it's equivalent of setting off from a Shackleton shop in London and skiing to Frankfurt. Two people got the funding to start the race. Colin O'Brady from the United States and Lou Rudd from Britain, who, as you know, is, is, is up next this evening after me. This is their route. And this shows their route compared with Cecily Skog and Ryan Waters, who we met at, met at the beginning. Lou and Colin O'Brady's route is about 300 kilometres shorter but arguably they probably had a harder time and their achievement is, is, is just as significant because they, they went solo and had to take everything. And this shows the route, the, the two unsupported uh, human powered compared with Borger Austin's amazing expedition with some, with some wind power. And polar travel, you know, it's not football or chess or golf or anything else that's been around for a long time where there's one game and one set of rules that everyone com complies with. This is a this is a, this is a, a range of options with unwritten rules, and you can start and finish anywhere. You can define your own style of travel. The only really important thing is that you have integrity and honesty with yourself and the outside world about what you're planning to do. And then, if you don't achieve what you've set out to do, you're honest with the outside world about what you what you've actually done. The next big challenge is to see if anyone can ski without resupply the full coast-to-coast -coast crossing from Burtner Island via the South Pole down to the in, past the inland edge of the Ross Ice Shelf across the massive Ross Ice Shelf out to the water's edge. Cecily and Ryan who came the closest skied 1,800 kilometres but this would be a distance depending on which route you go of at least 2,650 kilometres so adding another 850 kilometres is going to be an absolutely massive challenge. If you look into it, it's actually probably better to do to, to start the other way around and start from Bay of Wales and ski towards Birkner Island. Sir Ernest Shackleton called anyone's first polar experience the baptism of frost, which is a great phrase. I love it, the baptism of frost. And Antarctica remains a unforgiving, challenging captivating and enthralling place today as it was for the Scott and Shackleton and, and, and Amundsen. It's a truly, truly special place which is going to be an arena for pushing the limits of human physical, physiological and, and mental boundaries and endurance for years to come. And I personally can't wait to 
look for, forward to seeing what happens in the next few years. Thank you very, very much. And I would just like to finish by acknowledging and saying a big thank you to everybody who helped me with pictures and, and, and picture research for this. Thank you all to all of you very much indeed. Thank you. Ian, back to you. Indeed. Fantastic. That's great. That's great. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. How wonderful. It was um, a whistle-stop tour through 100 years of um, Antarctic, uh, Antarctic exploration. Fantastic. Um, okay, um, we are running fairly tight on time because we're hosting Lou, but um, questions are coming in thick and fast. So, um, right, let me throw a few at you then, Steve. Um, Rina Shah, fantastic talk. Thank you. What challenges would you say is or are left for Antarctic exploration adventure? Uh, you probably just answered that question right at the end. Can give a, I guess, a bit of an idea because the summer season is what say 80 to 85 days roughly 80 to 85 days it is possible to to make it longer but it's very expensive to do so because you've got to basically pay to to keep aircraft on charter and you know and a base and a ba and base open so if you've got deep pockets it is possible to to extend that time um i mean the obvious thing is almost nothing has been done adventurously in Antarctica in winter, but the, the difficulties of providing safety cover and therefore meeting the permitting requirement, requirements are almost insurmountable. But there is still new, there's definitely new route potential and there's lots of potential for people to challenge themselves and to have, you know, and to have personal achievements um, for, you know, indefinitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. So we heard, um, we heard talk from Sebastian Copeland um, the other evening, and he showed uh, the photograph of the Lenin bust at the Pole of Inaccessibility, which the, uh, the Russians tried to establish a base there. As far as I'm aware, nobody's actually done that on foot, solo, unassisted, and unsupport unsupported. Is that, is that a doable thing, um, you know, in a summer season? I think you're on mute. I can't hear you actually. Sorry, uh, you'd have to be extremely fit and fast to travel that sort of distance without using kiting. Very few expeditions have been to the Pole of Inaccessibility. And in fact, the weird thing is the Pole of Inaccessibility is point measured from, or, you know, the point furthest from, from the sea. And depending how you measure the ice shelves, you end up with different positions. So the Soviet Pole of Inaccessibility or Nedostopnosti from 19... 57 is isn't where it would be measured today and both the scott polar research institute and the british antarctic survey have got different points of where it is so it was about five poles of inaccessibility and only two of them have ever been visited so there's there's, there's other firsts up for gra up for grabs if you want to get into really arcane detail well, that's, yeah, great. that's great um just, uh, I mean, you touched on it at the very end, and because obviously we're about to um, to talk to uh, to Louis Rudd, um, and you talked obviously about the um, you know the crossing that um, he and Colin did in uh, 2018 19. It, it, did, did you have a sense? Did you feel that because it was such a big ask, you know, and obviously Ben Saunders attempted the year before Henry. Uh, we obviously know what happened to to uh, to Henry tragically. Did you do you think both would, would would make it across? I mean, both did. I mean, what was your kind of sense going into that of what what was you know what was going to unfold? Um, my sense was that Lou would make it because this was his third significant expedition, and I don't want to take away from his you know, but he you know he had you know he by then had got a stellar. Antarctic travel CV had proven himself on two two very significant ex expeditions already. Um, for Colin, it was going to be a big step up in what he'd already done in in Antarctica, but he had you know ath athletic credentials and had and achieved a lot in in other sort of related arenas of of in, in, endure, endurance sports and endurance activities. So. I thought the, the chances, if, if anyone's going to make a mistake and get anything wrong, it was probably going to be more likely to be Colin based on he had less polar experience. But we would, we thought, you know, I thought that they were both capable of doing it if it all went well for them both. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it obviously did go very well for both of them. Um, we've got time for one more. So one of the earlier ones, Rob and Gina, or Rob or Gina. Um, 
Why are dogs bad? Um, <laughs> there's two there's two reasons for that. The the the, the, the scientific reason is that it was a a fear that um, canine diseases, particularly distemper, might be transferred from the dog population into the wild seal population, and that would be disastrous for the seal population. The the Raya answer is that the uh, the humans were at the conference and and the dogs were weren't and uh, some and they needed to have an agreement about something, and uh, the dogs didn't get a vote. It's oh no, it, it's a great it's a great shame, particularly for everybody who overwinters because the dogs not only were a great form of transport, they also great company and and companions through those dark winter, winter months and and were a big part of life life on those polar stations and it's a uh, in many ways, it's a shame that that that, that era has come to an end. Yes. yes. Um, so, so, quick question from me. Actually, yeah. I, I, I'm intrigued. I think I've got the answer anybody anyway, and I'm sure it will, it's a longer answer than the 60 seconds I'm going to give you. But it, but if Amundsen, Scott, and, and Shackleton were presenting their plans to you today, um, what, what would you think? If Ailey existed 100 years ago, and and there was a Steve Jones as expedition managers, what would your response be? Would you? Laugh them out of the pub. Well, very. You've heard what I my analysis of some some of Scott's planning. It was too complicated, too much to go wrong. Hadn't been trained thoroughly, um, and I don't know if you had a quick look at one of the charts. Was where the depots were laid by Amundsen. Bang on every degree. He had a depot. Scott's depots were all over the place, or so inconsistent distances apart. Um, Amundsen's. You know, he took the best people he could. He trained. You know, he took risks. He pioneered a new route. He didn't know where he was going. You know, he took massive risks and gambled, but he, his risk management was good in the sense that he had the skills to be able to cope. Um, Shackleton's transatlantic, um, sorry, transantarctic expedition. I would say you know this plan doesn't doesn't hold water because he is. To, if it all goes brilliantly. And he gets across the South Pole and down the Beardmore Glacier to pick up his first resupply. He doesn't know it's there. And he knows how difficult it is to get those ships in and to get the supplies ashore. And I don't know why he didn't do the depot laying in one year and go around and start the expedition the next, because then he would have had security. I'm, can you imagine the stress of thinking, if I don't know something's there and we're all going to die if it's not? But I'm just hoping that the guys have done, have done their best. You know, it's it's an astonishing thing to, to you know, leap of faith to have, to have made, which I think was largely avoidable by doing it in successive seasons. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. And uh, and I guess the irony of it is that Shackleton didn't make it there, but the Ross Sea Party did actually lay the depots. But um, I mean, that, that that's a, another lecture in its uh, in its own right. So. Um, but Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us. It's been absolutely fantastic, and, and it's a great, um, a great introduction to to our next speaker, uh, Louis Rudd, um, who will be joining us on another Zoom link. So once we're off this, um, so everybody tuning in, if you want to check your email inbox, please, or if you go to uh, shackletonlondon.com in the Antarctica Now section, there'll be a link that will direct you straight through to that talk. Um, I'll be hosting that one, so uh, no need to rush over. I'll be heading over there right now. So um, you've got a couple of minutes to refill your glasses, and um, we'll see you on, this, on the other side. So, Steve, thanks so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And I expect to see you uh, on the next call. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.